Hey, good morning, Forest Park. So glad you've joined us this morning. My name is Josh. I'm gonna be your host, and I'm so glad you've joined Forest Park Church. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. So take a second right now and go to fplive.org slash connect. And you're gonna find a virtual connect card there, which just takes a little bit of information so that we can get to know you and you can stay in the loop of everything happening at Forest Park Church. One of my responsibilities as communication pastor is overseeing our social media. And we try to reach out to you during the week so that you can connect with church past Sunday mornings. So don't miss out on everything we post by liking our Facebook page, following us on Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. We try to post new worship content, inspirational stuff, so that you can connect with Forest Park throughout the week. Next week, we're starting a new series, and I can't wait for it. It's called Identity, and it goes into the new core values here at Forest Park Church. It goes into why we do the things we do and what we value. So don't miss out at 9 and 11 a.m. next week. It's going to be really, really great. This week we finished our series, Sanctuary, and it's been a really powerful series to start the year. We heard from Evan last week on prayer, and this week we get to hear from Preston, and I'm super excited for him to come and, and bring the word. Uh, but one thing out of this series that we're gonna start is a prayer and worship gathering. Uh, we really felt like this is something we need in 2021, and Jake led the cause with starting this. So we're really excited about it. It's January 19th at 6 p.m., and you can come and expect just a laid back worship gathering uh, you can pray, you can hear some songs and worship together, and we're really excited. So join us here at Forest Park at 6 o'clock on January 19th. We're really excited to start Sanctuary, a worship and prayer gathering. So at Forest Park, it has been a difficult year, to say the least. Uh, we've had a lot of challenges in 2020, and 2021 has already shown that it's not going to go away. And that's why we need your help. We need your help in your giving and your finances. You'd be surprised how much it really does help us here at Forest Park from just keeping the lights on, to getting supplies, to allowing us to make online services. It, it really has an impact on, on our community and, and we really appreciate your giving. So take a second right now and go to fplive.org slash giving. There you'll find all the information on how you can give online and you can also give using our offering boxes if you're here in person. Uh, you can also mail in your check, 300 Forest Park Road. And again, we just wanna say thank you so much for your giving. So before we get into worship, I wanna pray, and then the band is coming to lead us. Dear God, thank you so much that you are working in this new year, you're working in this church, and you're working in our community. I pray that we can worship, that we can lean into what you have for this new year, and that you can speak through Preston and the band throughout the rest of this service. It's in your son's name that I pray.
What's going on, Forest Park, and welcome to our last part of our Sanctuary series. I'm very honored to be able to join you online and be able to bring the message today. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to talk to you guys and talk about how great prayer is. I know that we're now in 2021, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do in your life and in my life this year. And so last week, Evan brought the message about the importance of prayer, and he talked about why we pray. And so this week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the what, what is prayer, and then I'm also going to give us some how tips, like how do we make our prayer life better? How do we make it more fulfilling? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm very excited, and let's jump right in. So one of the things I think we have to admit right before I tell you all what I want to tell you is that we all have to step back and agree on one thing, and that's that we all struggle with prayer. In fact, I struggle with prayer. Even as a pastor, there's not anyone watching today that would say, I don't struggle with prayer. And the reason I think that's so important for you and I to recognize and take knowledge is because we live in a society where we feel like some of us struggle and some of us don't. We live in a society like even, for instance, you take social media. I love Instagram. My wife loves Instagram. But Instagram can be a very evil tool if we're not careful. Why? Because Instagram, you only see people's highlights of their lives. What do they post? They post, well, I just got engaged. I just got married. I just had my first kid. I just got a new job. Look at this beautiful vacation my husband took us on. And you're wondering, why doesn't my husband take me on great vacations? But here's what people don't do, right? They don't wake up early in the morning, messy hair, messy bun, acne all over their face, messy clothes, and take a selfie and say, I just lost my job due to COVID and post it on their Instagram story, right? People only post their highlights. So oftentimes when we look at people's lives, we think, man, some people struggle with prayer, like me, and some don't. I wish I could be like them. But the truth is we all struggle with prayer. And even more so than that, I believe, we all struggle with following God. None of us actually follow God naturally on our own terms, right? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? I'll tell you what it's not that I don't do. I don't roll out of bed and the first thing I do is hit my knees and pray. That's not how I spend my first moments of the morning. That's just not how I operate. In fact, I check my phone, who's texting me. I go to the bathroom, I shower, I get dressed, I go to work. Most likely, you do the same thing. But we all struggle to follow God in the same way. And so today, as we talk about prayer, we're going to see why prayer is so important, what it is, and then we're going to talk about how to do it. So are you ready to find out how we can make prayer a better and more impactful part of our lives? I hope you are. So before we do that, let's go ahead and read a passage together. It'll be on the screen for all of you watching online, but I'm going to read it from here. It comes from the book of James, James chapter 5, and this is the half-brother of Jesus. And he's writing at the end of this book, and he says some impactful things, I think, that 
translate to our lives when it comes to prayer. So verses 13 through 16 in James chapter 5 say this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another and you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so when we look at those verses, one of the things we see, and this is the big point to take away from today, is that a Christian's life is a life that's ultimately marked by prayer. It's a life that's marked by prayer. So when you look at these verses, James is talking about when someone is sick, have the elders come, anoint them with oil, and pray for healing. When someone's suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, praise God and pray in that moment. If someone needs forgiveness of their sins, pray and they will be forgiven. We see all of these examples, good, bad, ugly, sickness, health, and James's uh, advice to us really is the same. Pray. Seek to pray. And so that is a life marked by prayer. In the hills and the valleys, a Christian life is one that prays. And so it's important before we talk about how to, how to increase our prayer life, that we look at two things that prayer is and two things that prayer is not. And I put them together into two sentences that kind of contradict each other. And so we'll see what prayer is and what prayer isn't. The first one is this. Prayer is not about instruction, but prayer is about intimacy. Uh, relationships ultimately for all of us fuel our conversations. If you're like me and you're an introvert, if you're in a new party, a new building, and there's a hundred people in there, you're, and you know one person really well, you're going to go seek them out, talk to them, and stay by their side all night. That's how I am at least. Uh, but when it comes to God, we ultimately only talk to him, I think, when we need things. Take it, for example, with your relationship with your spouse or your, your children or your friends. I don't just talk to my wife when I want something from her. The only time I talk to Carla isn't when I need her to pick up groceries, to fix dinner, to do the laundry, to do this for me or to do that for me. No, I talk to my wife about everything throughout the day, the good, the bad. How are you doing? How is your class? What are you going through? Are you feeling sick? Are you dealing with this? It's more than just do this. Can you do this? It's more about a relationship. But we've treated our prayer life, I think, a lot of times like it's all about getting answers. It's all about finding out instructions from God. Who should I marry? What should I do? Should I quit this job? Should I pursue this career? Should I do college or go to the you know, military? We always want to know what, if, and how from God. But God has not made prayer for us to be about instructions, but about intimacy. To be in his presence, to hear from him, to have him hear our heart, to have a relationship with him. I think ultimately, um, here's just a kind of a hypothetical scenario to let you know how I think. Um, I think if God came down today in person and we could see and touch him and hear him and he came to us with a deal that sounded like this, I think if we're honest with one another, we would take it. Here's what the deal would sound like. He would come down to you and I'll use me for example. He would say, Preston, I have a deal for you. Every time you pray to me and with towards me, anything you ask for, any question, any concern, anything you need, I will give you a very vocal and tangible and real answer so you know what to do. If you want to know if you need to marry this person, you'll know. If you want to know what job to do, you'll get the answer right then and there. You'll get your answer. But the catch is this. If you can have all the answers in the world you want, but you cannot have a relationship with me. I don't want anything to do with you outside of prayer. Anytime you try to talk to me outside of asking for stuff, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to deal with you. All I'm going to do is be here to give you answers to your questions. I think a lot of us, if we were honest, would take that deal. I know for me, there have been times where I'd be tempted to take that deal because a lot of us see our prayer life as mostly about instruction and not about intimacy with the one who loved us. So that's first and foremost what prayer isn't and what prayer is. Secondly, what prayer is and what prayer isn't is prayer is not just a part of our life, but prayer is our entire life. So we live in the South in a Bible Belt Christianity version that's kind of weakened and watered down our faith. What I mean by that, if you ask anyone on the street today, what does it mean to be a Christian? They will give you something along these lines. It means we go to church at least once or twice a month. It means that I have somewhat of a moral compass and that I say I believe in God. But if you look at the Bible, that's not what our faith really is. See, I think a lot of us today have gotten the mindset of separating our faith and specifically with this message, our prayer life, 
from the rest of our life. We see it as just something we do on Sunday morning, right? We come in when the pastor says to bow our heads and pray, we pray. Or, you know, my granddaddy used to pray before dinner. My daddy used to pray before dinner, so I pray for, before dinner and I say, God is great, God is good, Let him thank, let's thank him for our food. And it looks like something like that. But we don't take our prayer life and our faith with us every second of every day like God is intended for us to do. God is intended for us to take everything we're learning on Sunday morning, all the prayer that we're doing on Sunday morning, and take it home with us right after church. When our kids are rambunctious and we're getting frustrated, God's saying, pray in those moments. He's saying, be faithful in those moments. When we go to work and our boss is hounding us for the hundredth time and won't get off our case, even though we work harder than half the other employees around here, take our faith, take our prayer life into those moments. Prayer is not supposed to be something you just do like a hobby, like some people golf on Sunday morning, but something that we take with us every second of every day. In fact, the reason I know this is true is because I see this modeled in the New Testament from the beginning to the end. The apostles, the disciples that followed Jesus lived lives that were marked by prayer, and not just prayer in specific times, but prayer every second of their lives of every day. In fact, if you were to look at uh, the Apostle Paul, I believe you would see something interesting. But before I talk about the Apostle Paul, I want to read something that's going to help us answer this question. You may be wondering, Preston, how do I know that my prayer life is just a part of my life and not the whole thing like you're talking about. How can I know that I treat prayer life like that? I think you can answer one question that would help you find that answer. And it's this, when things go wrong, when things go bad in your life, when suffering comes your way, what is your instant reaction? Is it to turn towards God and get on your knees and pray? Or is it to try to figure out a way and try to handle it under your own power? And again, this is what James, we're going to go back to James really quick. I'm going to read three verses in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And they'll be on the screen for you guys. Again, I'll read them straight from here. This is what the Apostle James says at the beginning of his book. He says, Count it all joys, my brothers, when, he doesn't say if, he doesn't say if, if they occur. He says, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Basically what James is saying is that you're gonna have persecution, you're gonna have suffering in your life, so when you do, make sure it produces good in you. And so the Apostle Paul had this great saying in Philippians 1, 21, he says this, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And the reason I think the Apostle Paul is such an interesting figure is because he was an untouchable man, in my opinion. You think about that phrase, to live is Christ, to die is gain. People would come to Paul and say, you're preaching the gospel. We're going to throw you in jail and we're going to beat you until you can barely talk. And he said, okay, you throw me in jail. I'll just pray. God will miraculously let me go. And I'll even preach the gospel to your guards so that they'll become Christians. And that's what happened in Acts 16. He got thrown in jail. He preached the gospel to a guard. The guard became a Christian. And then God sent an earthquake to let him out of prison. Okay, okay. Well, you know what? We're just not going to throw you in prison. We're not even going to go through that hassle. We're just going to kill you here right now. He said, to die is gain. You kill me, I'll go be with Jesus. That's fine. You'll end my suffering right here and I'll go be with Jesus forever. He had a mindset that was untouchable. Regardless of what you threw his way, his mindset was the same. To live as Christ, to die is gain. And so why I think this is so important is because now I'm about to get into the how-to. How do we pray it's seven tips I have for you, but before we do that, it's important that we understand what prayer is and what prayer isn't. Because I'll tell you today that if you're seeing prayer as only about getting instructions from God and only a part of your life that you do on Sunday morning, then these tips will not help you at all. They won't make a difference. They won't change any way that you live. It's only when we really understand what prayer is and refocus our minds and our hearts around what prayer is meant to be that these tips will make an impact on our life. So the first tip that I want to give you is that prayer needs to be planned. Uh, we plan everything else in our life. We plan vacations. I play dinner, plan dinner dates with my wife. You know, when it comes to anniversary dinners, I don't just the day of think, you know what, I'll just take my wife to Taco Bell tonight. We'll just go randomly and then we'll come home. No, I plan those things out. Why? Because they're important to me. And the truth is for you and me today is that a thousand things every day are going to keep us busy and pull us in a thousand different directions. But we have to be intentional with planning our prayer life. Uh, Honestly, for you and me, I think we live in a culture that tries to save time so much. We live in a culture where there's life hacks on how to save five minutes doing your laundry, 10 minutes doing your taxes, 20 minutes changing your oil. And we think these life hacks are great, but when it comes to prayer, the truth is there is no hack for prayer. It's something we either do or we either don't do. 
But if we're going to do it and make it important, we have to plan it because we plan everything that is important in our lives. So we need to plan prayer. So I have two tips in this point I want to give you that's really going to help you plan prayer in your life. And it's this, do what's natural to you. So if you have a 25 minute commute to work every day, hey, turn off your phone, turn off the radio and spend that 25 minutes praying. You already have to drive 25 minutes, go ahead and do it. You have an hour lunch, spend the first 30 eating your lunch and spend the last 30 praying. So do what's natural to you. Do what comes in rhythm of your day-to-day schedule already and just fit prayer in the pockets that you can. But then the second tip is also do what's not natural to you. So that looks like waking up 30 minutes earlier than you normally do and spending those 30 minutes praying. Or how about this for some of you parents? Uh, Taking away an hour of your kid's computer and technology time and spend it with a family devotion and prayer time, right? Do what's not natural. Fit into prayer where it's not already natural. And what you'll find, I think, is that the more you do what's not natural, the more it will become a natural part of your life and your routine. But when it comes to planning prayer, we have to fit it in naturally where it's already got space, and then we have to do what's unnatural and make time for it where it can cut out some of the things we want to do. The fact is we've made time to rewatch our favorite show a thousand times. I can't tell you how many times I've watched The Office over and over and over and over again when I had nothing to do, but I could have used those hours to pray. It's all a matter about prioritizing and planning our prayer life into our schedule. Number two is to adopt ways to stop mental drift, right? So adopt ways to stop mental drift. So all the ADD people tuning in online who have been, you know, cooking and running around the house, not paying attention, tune in, get your ADD mind focused back here for a second. Um, So we have to stop mental drift. And honestly, one of the ways you're going to do that is by getting your phone away from you. You're not going to be able to focus when your phone's with you or around you while you're trying to pray because if you're like me, anytime it buzzes, anytime it dings, I need to know if this is an emergency. I need to check it. So we need to find ways to stop mental drift and we need to become comfortable with silence. I think we need to become comfortable with sitting in silence with nothing going on around us and just being in God's presence because ultimately that's going to make us tune in a little bit more. Here's the last thing I have to say about stopping mental drift. I believe we'll focus in more on praying and stop drifting mentally when we understand what's going on in our lives. So what I mean is every second of every day, there's a spiritual war going on in your life and in my life. Every second of every day, you're getting pulled in one of two directions. One, you're either getting pulled by God to go do what he would have you do, or you're getting pulled by the enemy to go do what he would have you do which is not what God wants. So every second of every day, there's a spiritual war going on in our lives that's pulling us in one of two directions. And the great thing about prayer is prayer focuses our heart and our minds back on God and listening and tuning into what he has to say instead of the enemy. So we won't drift mentally when we understand the severity of how we're being treated by the enemy and by God every second of every day. Now, here's the thing I have to tell you. When it comes to Satan and the enemy, he will. here's his number one tactic on how he's going to ruin your life, I promise you. It's not going to be what he did to Job, right, where he you know, killed his whole family, took everything he ever loved, and basically left him for dead. That's not the enemy's number one tool to ruin your life or my life. The number one tool the enemy is going to use to ruin our lives is to distract us, to get that that unexpected bill show up on your doorstep one day, to have a new project on your desk at work starting Monday that you weren't expecting that's going to take months of your time, Uh, that one thing that your child's doing at school that now you have to worry about how he's behaving at school. These little things the enemy will plant in your life to distract you from focusing on God and focusing on prayer. But when we understand the severity of the spiritual war in our life on a day-to-day basis, the more we won't focus or disfocus from what the enemy or from what God would have us do, which is praying. So number three is seek out people to pray with. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. We need each other in our lives. We were built to go through life with other people, not go through it alone. But the fact remains that we have an attitude in our country that has this kind of saying, I don't need nobody else, right? As long as I can you know, pay my bills on my own, as long as I can take care of my family on my own, as long as I can get done what I need to get done on my own, why would I ever need anyone else in my life? I can do it on my own. But God has made us to be in community with one another and rely on one another. So when we seek out people to pray with us and pray for us, there's something supernatural that occurs. When people come together to pray with and for one another, you look at the book of Acts, when people came together and the church was growing by thousands every day, It was because they did what? They had fellowship together, they prayed with one another, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. God does some supernatural works in and through our lives 
when we come together to pray. So we need to seek out people to pray with. And the fact is, our society has bred a culture that is only about making and sustaining shallow relationships. You think about your life, if someone in your family calls you and you don't want to talk to them, I'll just send them a voicemail. Someone you're texting is getting on your nerves, I'll just leave them on red. Even on social media, we can share as much of our life as we want people to see. Now, for some of you watching, you share way too much of your life on social media. It's time for you to, to pull the reins back a little bit. For the majority of us, we're allowed to only show what we want to show on social media. Our culture has bred us, us to understand and believe that we only need shallow relationships, but God's pushed us to be vulnerable with certain people in our life. Ask yourself this question. When's the last time I shared anything with someone that I trusted that truly made me feel awkward, weird, or uncomfortable? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time I did that? It's been a while, but God has built us to have deep relationships. So number three is to seek out people to pray with. Number four, get around those who do pray. So I said at the beginning that there's no one who is naturally good at prayer, and I believe that. But there are people that we know who have made a prayer life more consistent than maybe we'd hope ours would be. And we can learn from them and we can see how God's used that in their life. We do this with everything else in our life. When it comes to wanting to get out of debt, we go to professionals. We go and take a Dave Ramsey class because we see him as the professional who has all the answers. You want to learn a trade or a skill, you go to trade school. You either go to college or even now you can just go into the field at the bottom level and learn from those above you. How do you weld? How do you do electrician work? And you can learn from them. And even for me, I know when the pandemic started, I started learning Photoshop and I just watched four hour YouTube tutorials. You don't even need people nowadays to learn from quote professionals. You can just watch a video. And so we do this with everything else. Why don't we do it with prayer? And a lot of it, I believe, is that we don't know who those people are in our, in our life or in our circles that we could go to to learn from, learn how to pray. And, and I believe these people are sitting right around you, maybe not so much in your home, but here at the church of FPC, that they're people that are serving in adventure. They're people who are connected to next. And here's why it, our ministries are so important at church, because some of the people that's going to teach your child the most about prayer are going to be next volunteers. And that's why it's important your teenager comes to the next when we have it. When in Kid Ventures, some of the maybe the best things your child may learn from God or learn about God is from a Kid Venture volunteer. Or maybe for you, it's joining a small group. We're about to relaunch our small groups at FPC sometime this year. And when we relaunch them, some of the best things you can do is sign up to join a small group so you can find those people that you can say, wow, you know, they've been through so much. Look how God's blessed them. The fact remains, I think a lot of us feel alone in this world right now and all the struggles we're going through. There are a lot of us sitting here watching today that are saying, uh, you know, I've, no one has gone through a divorce like I've gone through a divorce in 2020. But what you wouldn't know is that there's a person right here at FPC in a small group that went through that five years ago, almost to the exact way you went through it. And God led them through it and showed them amazing things. And they would love to be there for you, to show you how God helped them. There are some of you who lost a child last year, unfortunately, and you're dealing with immense pain and immense hurt right now. And you're wondering, how is there ever hope to get on the other side? And what you don't know is there's someone in your neighborhood that right now, you know, God is wanting you to make connections with so that you can learn from them and see exactly how they went through that same struggle 10 years ago when they lost, lost their first child. Some of you losing jobs to COVID, you're wondering, how will I ever gain financial stability again? Yet there are people in this church right now, in ministries right now that want to serve you and have got through financial insecurities due to COVID and come out on the other side now in 2021. And they'd love to pray with you and be there for you. But when we don't make relationships a priority and we only see church as an entertainment service, we won't ever find those people and we'll only have shallow relationships in our life. So number four is get around those who do pray. And then number five is develop a system for your prayer list. So this could, I'll give you an example. You could take note cards and on one side you could write someone's name. So I'll write my wife's name, Carla. On the back on the lines, I'll write, she's dealing with this at school. She's going through this at home. She's dealing with these insecurities. And every day I pick up those note cards. Okay, how can I pray for Carla? Flip it over. I pray that, you know, God would bless her in her work, that God would kill her insecurities and replace it with peace. Those are some examples of how you can develop a system. But here's the key when however you develop a system, because that may not be for you, but however you develop a system, here's what, what is important that you remember no matter what system you develop. It's this, make sure you make your prayer life mostly about praying for others. 
And why do I say that? Because that's the example that was given to us. I wanna share with you an amazing story from the scriptures. I'm not, it's not gonna be on the screen, I'm just gonna paraphrase it, but it's so important, I think, when it comes to praying for others. So Jesus is in John chapter 17, praying to God the Father. And he's praying uh, the night before he's arrested and he'll be killed the, the, and crucified and beaten and bloodied. All that night before, he's praying to God. It's called his high priestly prayer. And there's about 20 something verses in this chapter. And what I find so amazing about this chapter is that out of the 20 something verses, 90% of that prayer is about praying for others. He starts out the chapter by saying, okay, you know, God, if you can have this cup pass for me, let it pass. But then the rest of his prayer is God, don't let my work be done in vain. Let people come and know you as their savior. Keep people safe as persecution comes their way after I'm gone. Make sure they rely on you and that you would keep them safe from the enemy's attacks that will come their way. Now, if I'm, if I'm honest, if I'm Jesus and it's the night before my arrest and death, I'm spending 10 hours on my knees begging God, please don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. And so that's my prayer. But then Jesus, even the day he's arrested, and killed and he's hanging on a cross, what is his prayer? His prayer is God forgive them for they not, do not know what they do. Even in the midst of his death, he's praying for other people. And so we should pray for other people. There's a, a question I was uh, heard years ago about prayer. Every time I talk about prayer, I think about it. It's this, and it helps me refocus my heart on making sure prayer is marked and centered around other people more than it is about me all the time. And it's this, if God were to answer all the prayers you've been praying lately, would it change anyone's life but your own? If God were to answer all the prayers you've been praying lately, would it change anyone's life other than your own? I definitely have been through seasons where that would not be the case. It would only have changed my life. But we have to make a system and we have to prioritize praying for others. Number six, tie your prayers in with the Bible. Um, this could be as simple as, you know, reflecting what you're reading in the Bible. So if you, you're reading Matthew 6 where Jesus is praying, teaching people how to pray. He says, Father, let your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some of your prayers back to God can be, God, let my life on earth be a reflection as it would be in heaven. Let my patience be a reflection to others as it would be in heaven. That's an example of praying what you're learning in your, your study of the Bible back to God. For some of you, that may be intimidating, so something you may want to do is find a psalm and literally just pray it back to God word for word. Dear God, blah, 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 amen, and literally just pray it back to him. There's nothing that warms God's heart more than hearing his children pray and speak his word back to him. So that's number six. And then lastly, this is the last point as we get ready to close. It's number seven. It says, pray until you pray. And I think a lot of times, not just with prayer, but with a lot of our faith, we get so intimidated by the destination, we never start the journey. We get so discouraged by how far we are from what it means to be a praying Christian that we never start praying. But God beckons us, he says, no, even if you're not gonna do it perfectly, start, learn, fail, get back up, I'll be here to help you. But we get so intimidated and so discouraged because we're not even close to what we're describing in the Bible or what I'm talking about today, that we don't even start. There's a beautiful uh, story in the Bible and the Gospels. You can find it in every Gospel uh, account except Luke's. It's this story you're familiar with of Jesus walking on water. So the story goes like this. The disciples go out on a boat and the, a storm comes their way and they become, it gets very windy and very rocky. Well, they see a, a figure coming from the distance walking on water and they, as it gets closer, they see that it's Jesus. Well, Peter being the hasty person he is, he often does before he thinks, starts chasing and trying to run towards Jesus. So he starts running to Jesus and he begins walking on water. And you know the story, as he starts to focus more on the storm than he does on Jesus, he begins to sink. The, story, the story's principle is often, uh, if you take your eyes off Jesus, you know things will go awry in your life, but if you keep your eyes focused on Jesus, everything will be okay. And I think that's a great and true principle to take from that story. But what I often think in relation to prayer, as we close, that this story points to us is that we as Christians should live by this mantra. And it's a song, I heard this song by Elevation, but it's kind of the opening line to their song. And I find it so convicting for me when it comes to prayer. The, the start of the song says this, I would rather slip walking on water than live a life wondering what if. For you and I today, that's my prayer for you, is that you would live by that mantra of, I'd rather take that chance getting out of the boat and slip walking on water knowing that Jesus is good and loving and will pick me up 
and keep trying and keep trying, even if I'm inconsistent, even if I'm bad at it, even if I do it out of wrong motives, that I would try and walk and slip on water rather than staying in a safe boat and live a life wondering what if. Some of us, as we look back on 2020, we wonder how different our life would have been if we would have just prayed more. Would my marriage still be together? Would my children um, be on a different path? Would I still have the job I have now? Would I still be struggling with the addictions I'm struggling, struggling with today? Wondering what if at the end of your life, what if I just prayed more? What if I just spent more time making it a priority? That is not what I want for you. It's not what I want for me. Instead, my prayer is that we would walk on water boldly. And even when we slip, we trust that Jesus will pick us back up and we'll continue to go forward. And so my prayer for you and I today as I close for 2021, my prayer for everyone at Forest Park is that God would make us tired and weary. You may be saying, Preston, that sounds like such an evil prayer. <laughs> that sounds so mean, but it's really not. I've found that oftentimes it's not until we're at the end of our rope, at we're very tired and very weary, that we turn to God and start looking at His ways instead of our own. If 2020 did anything for you and I, it's made us tired and weary. So my prayer is in 2021 that for some of us who have been faking our prayer life, faking our faith, putting on a show, and trying to do life under our own power and under our own strength, that God would make you tired and weary of doing it under your own way, and that you would start to turn to Him in prayer and turn to Him and see His way is greater than our own. And that's my prayer for you and I. A great prayer life is oftentimes planted and rooted in a soil of desperation. The question as we close today is, are you desperate in 2021 for God? Are you desperate to see change? Now is the time more than ever to prioritize prayer and to get on our knees and seek a holy God to change things in this world and in our own lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the gift of prayer. God, you didn't have to give us prayer, but you did. You allowed us to have access to talk to you anytime, any day, over any reason. May we never take it for granted. And may we as people of Forest Park Church be known as people who pray, and not just pray in the bad, but pray in the good. We pray in sickness and in health. In all situations, we seek you and pray. God, I pray in 2021, not just for the people watching, but for myself specifically and first and foremost, that I would grow tired and weary of doing things that are my own power. And that I would look to you as my first option in prayer. And that I would seek your ways higher than my ways. And that I would follow you to the best of my ability. And even when I slip walking on water, God, that you would pick me up and I would continue to try. Even in as inconsistent, as imperfect as it may be. God, would you bless us as we go? Would you bless us this week that we would take our faith and our prayer life with us outside of this hour on Sunday morning into our homes, into our workplaces, into our communities. And may we be known as men and women who pray. I pray this in your name. Amen.